Behold the man. His body is displayed for all the world to see. He is spread out, unable to move. He is pinned to where he has been fastened. He gasps for breath. Those who could have stopped it stand idly by. He calls out for his mother. Ever so slowly, oxygen is cut off from the brain where his breathing is regulated. First, he loses consciousness. Then, his heart stops. He is tended to, but it is too late. He has been killed by uniformed officers acting under the authority of the state. So it was for George Floyd. So it was for Jesus of Nazareth. There is perhaps no match for the power of the image of Jesus hanging on the cross. How many prayers have been lifted up to this image? How many movements have begun based on its compelling power? How many lives have been turned around? How many children have been educated? How many followers baptized? How many spirits comforted? How many lives lost? How many worship experiences offered? How many books written? How much music composed? Rome, meant for, cru for cru crucifixion to provide a lasting image of humiliation. Rome, meant for the humiliation to be as much the example as the death itself. And, at first, the followers of Jesus were reluctant to accept the image of the cross as the symbol of their movement for this very reason. For a while, the followers of Jesus were the people of the fish. Ironically, it wasn't until Rome was in charge of Christianity that the cross became its symbol. Since then, the cross has worked its way into our corporate psyche. Since then, the image of Jesus dying on the cross has been the thing. Last week, we were all witnesses to the most recent version of crucifixion. We all watched helplessly as a man's life was slowly snuffed out under the knee of the powers and principalities. We were all outraged that those who were there didn't do a thing to make it stop. And over the course of this week, we have seen and heard, and in some cases smelled, felt, and tasted the power of that image, the image of George Floyd dying next to the wheel of a police car under the weight of an unperturbed man in uniform. It will never be as popular as the image of Jesus on the cross, but those of us in the crowd, those of us who watched helplessly from our living rooms, now have an opportunity to make this terrible death matter. We weren't able to respond then, but we are able to respond now. And one day, by the grace of God, we will say, or maybe our children will say, that it was George Floyd's death that made the difference. Today, as we worship the God who transformed the humiliating death of Jesus on the cross into a powerful force for new life, today, we worship the God for whom no cross is too humiliating or painful to be the last word. Let us pray. Loving God, who is made known to us in the vulnerable humanity of people like Jesus and George, today we ask you to be with us during this service of worship. Give us opportunities as we sit for a minute to figure out how we will one day stand for the things that matter to you. Help us through this time to consider how we might make our lives matter for those who are on the margins of life, those 
who bear the brunt of all the ways life can be mean. Those who pay the price for the privilege so many of us enjoy. And do that, O oh God, we pray, in the name of Jesus, whose unremarkable death so long ago has made all the difference, and who gave us this prayer to say, to remember him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at Christian Temple. I'm Mark Wilson, Director of Music, and I'd like to share a short introduction to the music we'll be offering today. Our opening music will be an arrangement of Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, arranged for handbells. Anna Barry Royak will be the flute soloist, and the Christian Temple Bell Choir will be directed by Bo Lochte. Many thanks to Anna, Bo, and members of our bell choir for this beautiful music. The choir anthem will feature the music of George Frederick Handel. You'll be listening to Worthy is the Lamb from the Messiah. The video was taken in 2017 during our Easter service. Did you know that Handel wrote this crowning achievement in just 24 days? The proceeds of the first concerts were to be used to free people who had been imprisoned in the debtor's prison in Dublin, Ireland. We thank you, George Frederick, for your compassion towards the downtrodden. Our closing music will be, We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. <clears throat> and we will offer music and words to reflect upon as our nation struggles with racial injustice and inequality. Again, I wish for you a safe and healthy week and continue to look forward to the time when we'll see each other face to face. Thank you.
scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the very end of the first gospel, the Gospel of Matthew. It's the uh, great commission, commission Jesus gives to his disciples. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord add a blessing to this reading. May the God of of new life add a blessing to to this reading, and may we respond together in prayer. Loving God, it is our prayer just now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable to you, for you remain our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was January of the year 1973. The Vietnam War was raging and had divided the nation in two. Our cities were recovering from the shock of the riots that had followed the death of Martin Luther King Jr. The women's liberation movement had begun a few years earlier and was in full swing. The National Organization for Women, the Equal Rights Amendment. There was protest in the air that year. But in spite of all that, Richard Nixon had won the election in a landslide. He had won the election in November of 1968, which meant that in January of 1970, he had won the election in November of 1972, which meant that in January of 1973 was his inauguration. And one of the little known but time-honored traditions of presidential inaugurations was that Representatives of the Boy Scouts of America served as ushers for the inaugural parade. So I was there on that cold January morning along with other members of Troop 1558, the Boy Scout troop that was nestled in the heart of our home church. Ushering people to their seats in those temporary bleachers they had erected for the big parade. We were stationed right at that one place on the parade route where it turns off of Pennsylvania Avenue coming from the Capitol north onto 17th Street as it makes its way to the White House. We had all arrived early wearing our spiffy uniforms that I'm sure our mothers had ironed that morning and wearing the the colorful badges that I'm sure our mothers had sewn on to those uniforms and had stood in the cold weather while people gathered, ushering them politely, Boy Scout-like, to their seats. But then, then they were all there. They all got there early. They were all there in their seats, and the parade was an hour away from starting. So us Boy Scouts, being the adventurous Scout-like people we were, us 14, 15, and maybe 16-year-old Boy Scouts, we had some downtime. So we asked our scoutmaster, Mr. Joe, can, can we just walk around the block while we wait? We'll be back. Sure, he said, but, but make sure to be back by the time the parade begins. Oh yeah, Mr. Joe, we will, we'll be back. And so having secured the permission from our scoutmaster to walk the streets of Washington, D.C. unchaperoned, we took a little field trip down 17th Street headed for the mall, where it looked like a different kind of group had gathered. We walked away from all the crowds that were there for the parade, and as we got closer to the mall, we approached a crowd of a different kind. 
We had left a crowd of well-dressed parade admirers, nice families decked out, bundled up in stocking caps and earmuffs and, and mittens and found us a crowd of protesters decked out in, in military fatigues, donning long hair parted down the middle with those cool headbands wrapped around their heads. It was, it was kind of cool to be there for the parade and to be a part of history and all that, but it was awesome, awesome to stumble upon those protesters. Oh my, there was all this energy in the air. There were all these colorful signs. There was this... There was this aroma in the air, the smell of freedom. Everyone was so nice to us, so chill, so laid back. All those 18, 19, and 20 year olds wearing colorful protest buttons. Richard Nixon, let the good crimes roll. They were so nice to us, 14, 15, and 16 year old Boy Scouts who were donning our own colorful badges. Hey man, come on over. Wow, look everybody, it's a Boy Scout, far out. We began to become one with the crowd, mesmerized by their imagination and their magnetism. We were sinking deeper and deeper into that energy, into that welcoming group, when one of us happened to look down at our watch. Hey guys, we gotta get back. So we did. We left the protest and we went back to the parade. We went back from the world of protesters to the world of the parade. We went back from that world that was calling us forward into the world from which we had arisen. Back from all that might yet be in, next, in the next few years of our own journey into what we had known, what had always made us feel safe, what had nurtured us thus far. We went back from the protest to the parade. As I look back on that cold January day, I don't really see it as a turning point in my life. I did not right away trade my Boy Scout uniform for ripped up jeans and John Lennon sunglasses. I still went and got my hair cut for a few years after that at the, uh, at the barber shop on the Air Force Base. But I do look back on that day now and see it as very symbolic of what happens when we find ourselves at that point in our lives where having been nurtured by a particular way of looking at the world, our nest, if you will, we begin to question that way, to push against the edges of what we have known. Each of us goes in a way from being part of the parade of people who gave us our home and our point of view to finding life outside that home and in one way or another, to protest that very parade. To essentially protest against that with which we have been raised. Protest against the community that has nurtured us and begin to figure out on our own where our own values lie. This text for today, I think, captures that moment when Jesus' disciples went from being part of the parade to being part of the protest. The disciples had been following their leader, their, their teacher, their friend. They had enjoyed the good times. They had been there and been together for the terrible times, together through it all. But now all of that had changed. Jesus had been killed. He'd been crucified. And then, and then he had been raised. Maybe he was still alive. Maybe they had seen him in the, in the air. He had, uh, all of this maybe but not like it had been. So those disciples, they'd gone back home. They'd gone back to where it had all started, to the green hills of Galilee, where the parade that had been their lives awaited their return. And sure enough, Jesus, their leader, appears to them there, back in their home, back in Galilee, just like old times. And most of them believed, and most of them were happy to see him, I imagine. But then Jesus has these jarring words for those disciples that begin with go. Go, go, go therefore and make disciples, not just here in Galilee, but in all the nations. Go meet people, go change people by who you are and by what you have to say and by what you've learned from me and from us together. 
baptize them, give them a new lease on life, and, and then do this, Jesus says. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Hmm. Do that, and I will always be with you. Teach them to obey what I have commanded you. Not what they've been brought up with, but what Jesus has taught them, commanded them. Jesus, it seems to me, is calling his followers to leave the comfort of the nest that had been so good to them, to leave the parade they had enjoyed for so long, and to go and join the protest. Walk the streets, join the protest. Jesus is inviting his disciples to set aside what they'd known and to be obedient to a new way of being. Having given his disciples the comfort of being together, Jesus gives them the compass to guide them while they're apart. And so it is still true, I think, that our faith tradition gives us these two great gifts. Our following Jesus gives, these, gives us these two great gifts. Our faith tradition gives us the parade, the people who are part of our tribe, the ones who see things the way we do, the template for how we live. But our faith tradition, especially the tradition that revolves around Jesus, this, this rabbi, this teacher that sensed the immediacy of God's realm in the air, also compels us to step outside that parade, to test it, if you will. It's a part of our coming of age, right? But it will always feel like an act of protest. I don't know if any of you have had the chance to see the miniseries on Netflix called Unorthodox. This moving drama is based on a true story of a young woman who was raised in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community of Williamsburg, Brooklyn, where the rules were strict and there was little if no tolerance for stepping out of line in that parade. But things happened in this woman's life and the time comes for her to leave. In a way, she is coming of age, not unlike the rest of us, but her leaving feels so much like a protest, like an act of defiance. There is protest, I think, embedded in what it means to follow Jesus. There needs to be in our faith a standard greater than, than that which we've known by which to measure our decisions, our acts, and our lives. There, there needs to be in our lives, I think, an obedience to Christ which calls us always to more than we've already been, which calls us to question that which we've been taught by our parade. You know, back in 1973, when protest was in the air, the church, for the most part, was on the wrong side of history. Back in 1973, we were all about the parade, and we, in the church, we shook our heads and in some cases wagged our fingers at all the protesters. Now, here we are, almost 50 years later, and what do you know? We have a second chance. The church has been given a second chance to be a part of the protest that just might finally bring about lasting change. The protest that might finally give us the chance to yank the evil of racism out of the soil of our land, to see it for what it is, and to address its deadly consequences. And while our church is busy doing that, each of us individually might do well to wonder how we might be more obedient to the Christ whose call inevitably leads us to wander away from our own parade so that we can see it for what it really is and wonder about it. I'd like to close these thoughts by offering a few of our members to share where in the last week where protest has been in the air, where they have seen obedience to the Christ. This week, I have seen obedience to Christ 
take the form of police officers who have knelt with protesters, police officers who have hugged young children who are scared of them, and police officers who have pulled other police officers away from committing acts of violence against U.S. citizens. One of the ways this week that um, I have seen or heard obedience to Christ taking place is um, two instances. I have one heard and one seen. The first one heard um, is the story that you hear about the clergy and laity at um, St. John's Episcopal Church who were handing out water and um, simple medical supplies to protesters around the, surrounding the White House. Um, that was what they were doing within a day or so of part of their church having caught on fire. That's what they were doing when um, the president decided to walk across the street and they were tear gassed and run off. Um, that to me was obedience to Christ in that even in the face of imminent danger, you are doing what he has taught us to do. Um, the other thing is an image that came out of Portland, Oregon of protesters lining the bridge, um, Burnside Bridge in Portland, thousands and thousands of people laid on that bridge, face down, hands clasped behind their back, um, in silence for eight minutes and 43, six seconds, whatever it was. Um, it is an image that has stuck with me because I know that the Jesus I follow would have been a member of that crowd if he were here today. Um, there are lots of images out there and I hope that those of us who follow a Christ who would be part of these protests are able to find peace um, in knowing that we as a nation and a world are doing everything we can to fight um, injustice and inequality. Christ commands us to love God and love others, and Jesus modeled that the way that we love others is through actions and standing up against injustices. I saw thousands of people do just that in Baltimore this week in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Um, they protested police brutality and racism, and it's my hope that we all continue to follow in Jesus' footsteps that way.
Good morning, Christian Temple and all who are joining in for this worship service. I'm Wade Hannum, one of the elders at Christian Temple, and I welcome you. Last week, we spoke of tongues of fire and the disciples being sent forth. This week, we speak of the disciples being sent forth to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all, to obey all things the Lord has commanded. I am struck that the challenges we face today of racism in all its forms charge us as disciples with the duty and opportunity to live up to the words of Matthew. As I look at the definitions of baptism, we have the traditional definition of being baptized into the life of Christ. Most of us lay people will have little opportunity for that. But when I looked at an alternative definitions, I found that baptism is also defined as a trying or purifying experience or initiation and also to initiate. When I combine these definitions with the disciples' additional charge to teach each other to obey all things the Lord commanded, it became much easier for me to wrap my arms around Matthew's scripture titled The Great Commission. Put simply, the greatest commandment is to love one another as we love the Lord. With that today, we are witness to peoples, communities, and nations of all races, creeds, and stations in life coming together and standing up for those who are oppressed and at the affect of injustice, including all forms of racism. The communion of your children, initiated from the glaring injustice of this past few weeks and beyond, may well help to initiate change and provide for us and others a purifying experience of heart and mind, provide a teaching moment and initiation into a climate ripe for justice, and affirm a unified intolerance for injustice and racism in all its forms. But as we look to the Lord, we must know this is a life struggle, not an event struggle. There's plenty of injustice in this world to keep us all busy baptizing and teaching. Let us pray. Mother, Father, God, we gather around our homebound altars as family and community. May we live the scripture's commandment. May we initiate change, even in ourselves as in others. May we teach and learn to be intolerant of injustice and racism in all its forms through word and deed. And may the sustenance of this communion in the elements of bread and the cup provide us with the courage, conviction, and strength to live out our lives practicing your greatest commandment. Amen. For it was on the night when the injustice of betrayal was inflicted upon Jesus that he took bread and he broke it, saying, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as the meal ended, he took the cup and shared it, saying, take this all of you and drink for this is my blood, blood shed for your sins. And as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. And I will paraphrase, comes again in glory amidst justice for all the Lord's children. The bread of life. the cup of salvation. Each of us is charged with living out the Great Commission. Go in peace.
more for the benediction. Good and gracious God, merciful master, walk with us while we run this race. Speak to us as we lift our voice. Use our hand so that they do not become fists. Change our hearts so that our rage will shift to rehabilitation. Convict the country so it can finally be the land of the free and the home of the brave. We pray this prayer in the name of an innocent black man by the name of Jesus, who was killed by a government and still rose again. And with that power, we march on until victory is won.